it's important for us to remember that we can't do anything without God. But God needs us too, which is why he calls. And last week I spoke to you about hearing God's call. Actually, not hearing it, but listening for it and listening to it. There's a difference to hearing and listening to something. Isn't that right, ladies? I mean, I can hear my wife talking to me, but am I listening to what she's saying? I'm getting better. She doesn't have to grab my face and say, look at me as she talks to me anymore. I'm getting better. I can still do better, but I'm getting better. But there is a difference between hearing and listening. So let's say this past week we've taken the time to really listen for God's voice. We've heard it, and now we don't know what to do. Well, I'm going to look at two different ways from the Bible to respond to God calling us or speak to us and our response to Him speaking to us. The first one is the one that every pastor wishes to be the go-to response, although we know it usually isn't. Anyway, let's, uh, let's look at Mark. It's chapter 1. We're looking at verses 14 to 20. It's on page 1,424 in the Pew Bibles. Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 14. We're going to read it responsively. I'll read one. You read one. We're going to go back and forth. So it's chapter 1, book of Mark, verse 14. It's on page 1424, or if you're on your phone, it's Mark 114. Verse 14 says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Read verse 15. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Read verses 17 and 18. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Verse 20. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for offering me the job of being a disciple. Just like James and the others, thank you. Help me to be more like James by following you all my life. Show me ways to tell others about how much God loves us. Amen. The line you read, verse 18, at once they left their nets and followed him. This is, the, this is the response that every pastor wants every church member to have whenever you're asked to do something. Think about our church. When we ask for volunteers to do something, to head up a committee or to charge, take charge of a task or to serve on session or, or to, to join a committee, how often do we get an immediate response of yes? It does happen sometimes. Someone who's ready, someone who's looking to be involved already, someone who's itching to get going. It does happen. Sometimes. Sometimes. Maybe in this situation, James and John, maybe they were just looking for an excuse to get off their boat, leave their dad behind and set off on an adventure. Maybe. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. That's the proclamation that Jesus makes. And it's followed by an invitation. Repent and believe the good news. And then the invitation to come follow me. Jesus was was priming the pump, you might say. But have you ever wondered why Peter and Andrew and then James and John, that they just jumped to respond to Jesus so easily and so quickly? 
And I've often wondered why they would just leave their livelihood and walk away from the responsibilities that went with it. Why would they just walk away from everything they had? Because one man said, come follow me. Maybe they did so because it was the right time. Now, there are two different types of time in the Bible. There's kairos and chronos. Now, chronos is it's linear time. It's like on a clock. This is the time that we're most familiar with. This is the time we live by, chronos. Many of us get up with an alarm. We have set schedules through the day. We have to be at work at a certain time. You take lunch at a certain time. You get off of work at a certain time. You have dinner at a certain time. You go to bed at a certain time. We live by chronos. Some of us are retired and we don't care. But some of us still have to, we're, we're bound by chronos. The other one is kairos. This is the appropriate time. It's the right time. Or as many of us say so easily, it's God's time. But what does that mean, God's time? Well, it could be an idea of preparation, of waiting, of watching, and listening. It could be conversations and questioning that plants and some seeds, and, and it gives them that, those seeds times to grow. See, Jesus, Jesus could have known of some doubts in these fishermen's hearts about if this was what they wanted to do for the rest of their lives. He could have been wandering by and heard them complaining about the work that they had to do, and it's hot, and it's sweaty, and it's smelly, and I always go home smelling like fish. And uh, He could have heard this. Jesus could have known that this was the right time, Kairos, to ask them to follow Him. See, that's what made it the right time. And the kingdom is near because they were somehow open to God, ready for the Spirit to come and set their feet on a new path, to respond to the hope in their hearts. You see, God's call isn't arbitrary, but it's perfectly timed. Because in our lives, God's call often comes at specific moments, inviting us to respond with faith and with trust. His call was personal addressing each disciple individually, as he does with us. It's a call to a relationship, not just a duty. Simon, Andrew, James, and John, they responded immediately, leaving their nets and following Jesus. And Jesus promised to make, their, make them fishers of men. Now, the disciples had to leave behind their nets, symbolizing leaving behind the familiar and stepping into the unknown. And this is where we often run into problems. You want me to leave everything I'm familiar with? My friends, my life, sometimes my job and my family? To follow you? To go somewhere I'm, um, that I'm uncomfortable? Somewhere strange and scary? To communicate with people that I don't know in a place that I don't know? To start all over again from the beginning? And my response is supposed to be, at once they left their nets and followed him? Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. I know my call came, and at first I was like, okay, I hear you. And 10 years later, I was like, all right, God, yes, I'll do this. And 15 years later, 15 years later I finally said, all right. And if that's our response, why are we surprised when we talk to someone who doesn't have a relationship with God, and yet we say things like, you're a sinner and you have to change your ways? You're going to have to give up all of your old friends. You're going to have to stop doing the things that you do for fun because it's wrong. You're basically going to hell and you need to repent, change, and start over again with Christ in your heart or you're never going to make it. And we say that to them and then they respond with the second type of response that I'm going to talk about today. The response where instead of leaving our old lives behind, we turn and we dive even deeper into what we're doing and we run from God. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Jonah. And we're looking at chapter 3. We're starting with verse 1 in chapter 3. It's on page 1,323 in the Pew Bibles. It's Jonah chapter 3, starting with verse 1. We're going to do this one responsively also. <clears throat> so verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Read verse 2. Jonah, 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Remember that. It took three days to go through it. Read verse 4. It took three days to get through it. Jonah went one day. Verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Now, jump down and read verse 10 for me. Verse 10. Now, Jonah was a man of faith. He was a man who loved his God and his people, yet Jonah got himself into a mess of trouble. And it all began when the word of God came to Jonah in a dream. And in his dream, God told Jonah to leave Israel and to go to the great city of Nineveh and to preach against it because of its great wickedness. Now, Jonah was told by God to go and preach against the wickedness and to warn the people there that the city would be destroyed 40 days after he arrived. And instead of answering God's call to him, throwing his net down and following God, Jonah tries to flee in the opposite direction. So instead of making the 500-mile trip eastward from Jerusalem, Jonah boards a merchant ship at the port of Joppa, and he heads towards Tarshish, a city that's 2,000 miles the other direction. Now that's some serious running, choosing a 2,000-mile trip in the wrong direction to get away from God because he's calling you. Yeah, and I've seen some people run like that from church before. The people that we go up to and we say, if you don't change, you're going to hell, and you've got to, they're running that 2,000 miles. Anyway, Jonah's at sea when the ship he's on is caught in a huge storm that starts ripping the ship apart. Everyone on board is scared. They're throwing everything overboard trying to save the ship. They even stop and they all pray to their own gods. But Jonah's down, he's below sleeping. They approach him and after a while he admits that the storm is probably his fault because he's running from God. And they get mad and he he lets them throw him overboard to save everybody else on the ship. So Jonah's in the water, he prays and God sends the big fish and the rest, well, is history. You see, Jonah's initial disobedience led to a storm, a whale's belly, a repentant prayer. Despite Jonah's rebellion, God speaks to him again. The word of the Lord came a second time. But let's compare these two calls in Jonah. Chapter 1, verse 2, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness had come come up before me. Now, chapter 3, verse 2, get up and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim it, the message I tell you. It's kind of the same and kind of not, don't you think? Well, there is the get up in the second call, but that's because Jonah's lying on a beach covered in regurgitated meal of a great fish that served as an uber. So yeah, get up, Jonah, and maybe take a shower. Now, I'm pretty sure that was implied, but get up, take a shower, and let's go. I mean, Nineveh, it's still a great city, and Jonah's still called to proclaim. But the tone has changed. I mean, there's no talk of the wickedness in the second call, just the command to tell them what God wanted them to hear. But it seems like the tone has changed. And this makes us think that maybe the hard line in chapter 1 was more for Jonah's benefit than for Nineveh's. See, God knew Jonah didn't want the job. He didn't much like Nineveh and was likely to hit the bricks or the waves in this case. But now that Jonah's been humbled somewhat, God just says, go tell him what I want you to tell him. And Jonah drags his feet part way into the city. Remember, it takes three days to get through Nineveh. He went one. He only went one-third into the city. Is he still doing what God told him to do? But everybody heard his message. 
Now, these two stories are about a call and response. Jesus calls the disciples, and they follow. God calls Jonah again, and Jonah finally gives in. In both stories, there's a persistence to the call, but in that, there's also a persistence in the need to respond. We cannot become the people of God without responding to God's call on our lives. See, too often we imagine that God's call is like a commandment instead of an invitation, meaning our response is more about obedience than bringing our full selves to respond by participating with God's good news. But if we think of our journey of becoming the people of God like a phone call, God dials the phone and it rings, and it rings, and it rings, and then we finally pick up the phone and say, hello, and we start the conversation. See, we recognize that both God's call and our answering is needed to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. If God was to just pick up the phone and dial and let it ring and ring and ring and ring, which some of us do, and ring and ring and ring, there's no conversation. We have to respond to the ringing of that phone. And one of our constant questions when addressing a Bible text is, who are we in this story? If we're honest with ourselves, we can't help but identify with Jonah. Maybe this is our story too. Maybe we ran in the opposite direction at first. And it's good to be honest enough with ourselves to admit that. Yes, God, I hear you calling, but I can't stand up in front of people because there's no way I can talk in front of people. I'm too nervous and I'm too scared. Well, sure, God, yes, I understand what you want me to do, but no, I can't do that. There's no way I can do that. The song we read, Moses had stage fright, but God called him anyway. David brought a rock, but God used that rock. It's good to be honest enough to admit that to ourselves. But the real call of the book of Jonah is to be more like the God who sent him, the one who believes in second chances, the one who doesn't give up issuing the invitation even when the response isn't what he had hoped for. We should ask, you know those people that we beat over the head and scared them away? We need to ask them again and again and again. We should invite again and again. We should make ready and roll out the carpet and focus our hospitality again and again. See, that's what it means that God didn't give up on Jonah. We don't give up on one another, and we should not give up on the community around us. We may have to change the way we approach them. If we approach them with love and caring instead of a stiff Bible to beat them with, maybe, maybe when we call again, they might say yes. But you see, no matter how often they run from us or how they run, how far they run, God hasn't given up and neither should we. He hasn't given up on us. We can't give up on them. I mean, we are in the business of mentoring people for Christ, aren't we? And if that's the case, we have to keep going. And we have to keep pushing and we have to find new ways to reach those people. Not the beating over the head, that doesn't work. That just makes them run 2,000 miles the other way. It makes them dig deeper into what they're doing instead of finding the love of Christ. Now, God hasn't given up on us. He still loves us with all of our mistakes and our faults, and we know better. But He still loves us. So we can't give up loving them. And we have to keep loving them over and over again. Because that's what God has done for us. Don't give up. Are you ready to answer the call when the phone rings from God? Because that call might just, to, might just be to say, hey, I need you to call that person and talk to that person and tell them about my love. Because that person might need it.
And if we don't answer the phone, then who's going to talk to that person? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for not giving up on us and repeatedly extending your grace and mercy toward us. Please help us share the grace that we have freely received from you with the community. And let us not give up on them just as you haven't given up on us. So God, show us the the ways that we can love them so that they can know you. Show us the ways that we can love them so they would listen to the message we have of you. Show us the ways you want us to approach them just as you have approached us. We pray this in your name. Amen.